right? Okay, so I'm not Jerry Hobbs. I'm only introducing Jerry Hobbs. <laughs> Hi, it's a pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Uh, Jerry Hobbs has, uh, uh, is visiting us from the uh, Information Sciences Institute, ISI, at uh, USC, where he's been for the last five years. Before that, he was at uh, SRI, where, of course, they had a large group working on, I guess you could call it AI and NLP and things of that sort, and he's a past president of ACL, and he just told me that if I wanted to go further back, I could mention that he has his PhD from NYU. Uh, but, of course, we know him for all his NLP work, and I'll just let you take it from here. Jake? Um, thank you. I have a, uh, a handout. Um, well, not quite. I mean, I, I just want you to have a, a chance to, uh, uh, the text I'm going to do is, uh, is not easy. Um, the, uh, so Johns Hopkins is the uh, hotbed of uh, statistical NLP, probably more so than any place ex with the possible exception of ISI. And, uh, and so I, I figured I better not talk about statistical NLP here or I'll get ripped to shreds. So I, well, but if I'm going to give something symbolic here, then it's going to sound like it comes from outer space. So I figured, well, then I might as well give a talk that does come from outer space. So that's why I'm talking about uh, when will computers understand Shakespeare. Um, and what I'd like to do is take a look at one uh, a particular poem of Shakespeare's and ask uh, the question of how, how well we would do currently and how well we can hope to do in the near future on uh, understanding uh, various aspects of the, uh, the poem that would uh, count as part of, uh, of what it would be to understand the poem. So it's uh, Shakespeare's 64th sonnet, which I will read. It's, it's actually a poem about entropy. I mean, the summary is that... Um, uh, he looks around and he sees that uh, there are all these things that you would think would be permanent and they're falling apart. And uh, that leads him to think that, um, uh, that um, um, the love that he has now is also going to disappear at some point and, and that makes him uh, feel uh, uh, very sad. So the uh, poem is, uh, when I have seen by time's fell hand defaced the rich proud cost of outworn buried age, when sometime lofty towers I see down raised and brass eternal slave to mortal rage, when I have seen the hungry ocean gain advantage on the kingdom of the shore and the firm soil win of the watery main, increasing store with loss and loss with store, when I have seen such interchange of state or state itself confounded to decay. Ruin hath taught me thus to ruminate, that time will come and take my love away. This thought is as a death, which cannot choose but weep to have that which it fears to lose. Um, <clears throat> all right, so what, by the way, did everybody get a uh, handout? Is it, have they made it all the way around? Were there enough? What I'd like to do is consider kind of some of the phenomena that occur in any text and in particular occur in, and for the most part in very problematic forms in this text. Uh, so I want to look first at, the, uh, at parsing and discovering the syntactic structure, uh, then at generating a logical form for the uh, text, then at problems of co-reference, uh, then interpreting the predicate argument relations in the text and some of the interpretive moves that we have to make in order to make sense of the uh, text and then to look at uh, various kinds of coherence, in particular uh, clause internal coherence and then the interclausal coherence structure of the uh, poem, uh, just to see kind of how far we've come and, uh, and uh, how far we have to go. I mean, I, I was saying so to somebody earlier, this would be uh, an uninteresting talk if, uh, oh, we can, we can deal with this, no problem. It would also be an uninter uninteresting talk if the uh, conclusion were we can't even begin to touch this. Uh, but as, as it happens, I think the truth is somewhere in between, and so that, that should make it interesting. So, um, well, the first thing to say is when you try to parse this, you can't, right? Because, I mean, the first 12 lines constitutes the first sentence, and you're not going to parse a sentence that long, and uh, you're not going to parse a sentence that complicated. Um, but what I did was I ran it with uh, Charney X parser and kept, 
kept cutting it down and down and down until I got a sentence that did parse correctly. And what I ended up with, uh, with all of the content of the poem, but, uh, you know, something is lost in the translation, uh, were the, uh, these sentences. I have seen that the rich, proud cost of outworn buried age is defaced by time's fell hand. I see sometime lofty towers down raised. I see that brass eternal is slave to mortal rage. I have seen the hungry ocean gain advantage on the kingdom of the shore. I have seen the firm soil win of the watery main, increasing store with loss. By the way, watery, it, uh, it just, this uh, apostrophe just, you know, it, it interpreted it as, an as a possessive every time, and there was no way to get the attorney ex parte to do anything else but that. Uh, so I had to add the E to watery. That's one of the only two words I had to change. Uh, I have seen the firm soil win of the watery main, increasing loss with store. I have seen such interchange of state. The state itself is confounded to decay. So this all sounds a lot more like uh, Walt Whitman than uh, Shakespeare. Um, <laughs> ruin hath, actually, the last few lines are, are, it did pretty well on. Ruin hath taught me thus to ruminate. The time will come and take my love away. This thought is as a death which cannot choose but weep to have that which it fears to lose. For some reason, the Charniac parser, when given the, uh, the word cannot, uh, doesn't get it as a modal. It treats it as, a, uh, as an adverbial, as an adverb. And so the only way to deal with it I, that I could figure out was to break it apart. Um, so in, in, in a way, that's not bad. I mean, we get all the content and we get, you know, the right, the right structure for these sentences that in any case are at least somewhat close. Why won't, the, why won't the main thing parse, the, the whole the poem as it is parse? Well, the big problem is the, uh, the length. As I said, the first 12 uh, lines are uh, one sentence, and you know, something that long is, is not going to parse in current technology. Then the inversions always caused it a lot of problems. So sometime lofty towers I see down raised instead of sometime I see lofty towers down raised. Uh, it had a lot of trouble with uh, small clauses, so I see brass eternal, slave to mortal rage. Um, I think it took that as brass eternal slave as a, a single noun phrase, and then to mortal rage as a modifier on that. And then, you know, uh, parsers of every variety have a lot of trouble with conjunctions, and uh, this was no exception here. So increasing store with loss and loss with store, for example, um, was uh, parsed with, um, so it's store with loss and loss with store, right? So it conjoined loss and loss and, uh, and then had uh, the final with store modifying the, uh, the uh, second loss rather than. Store with, store with increasing store with loss. Uh, store with loss isn't a constituent, uh, right. and a small clause wouldn't be considered a constituent either, I believe. Um, and that's conjoined here. I, I, I see lofty towers down raised. I, I think it, I'm not sure. I mean, the the Charniac parser on small clauses gets sometimes it gets it as uh, as a as a constituent, and sometimes it doesn't. Okay, I stand corrected. Yeah, I <clears throat> I don't know what the uh, the instructions on the, the pen tree bank were. But, uh, well, here, yeah. you had the adjective inversion, so it the noun Actually, the adjective inversion in Brass Eternal didn't uh, give it any problems. But you said it got... You no, it, it, the, the, it, got, it got problem with the small clause, the Brass Eternal slave to mortal rage. It, it uh, screwed up on that. But when I changed that to, I see that Brass Eternal is slave to mortal rage. It had no trouble with Brass Eternal having the, the postposed uh, adjective. <clears throat> um, so my general conclusion about the uh, parsing is that it's well, it's not too bad, you know. I mean, it it made some mistakes, but you don't, you know. But it did get something, and uh, uh, you didn't have to um, uh, change it uh, in 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 very radical ways in order to get the uh, the parser to actually work. And uh, insofar as we can parse it, it is uh, straightforward to uh, translate it into logical form making explicit the predicate argument relations and making inference possible. 
Um, <clears throat> straightforward is a uh, favorite word of mine, actually. Um, it, that, it characterizes the things that I think can be done in a day, but whenever I try to do them, I'm working, still working on them a year later. Um, so what we've been doing in the last year is working on generating logical form from uh, the Charniak parses in general. <clears throat> and um, what it's led me to conclude is that the pen tree bank annotations and therefore parse trees uh, produced by statistical parsers trained on the uh, pen tree bank uh, are barely more than glorified part of speech taggers. Uh, I mean, there's no structure in the left half of uh, noun phrases. So, for example, in uh, internal combustion engine, you don't know whether it's the combustion that's internal or the engine that's internal. Um, there's no complement adjunct distinction. So, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was mugged by a lamppost versus I was mugged by a, by a man in a black coat. Um, you don't know... Uh, you, you know, you can't tell whether it's an adjunct or they, or just a, or rather, or, or uh, provides an argument. Uh, gap filler relations are unmarked. Uh, the presence of gaps are unmarked. So if you have something like um, the book that I left versus the idea that I left, uh, where in the first of them you need you need to know that there's a gap there that gets filled by the book. I left the book. Whereas in the idea that I left uh, is preposterous, um, you don't have a gap there. And when you're just looking at the, uh, the parse tree, they, they look alike. These two uh, uh, constituents look alike um, in the uh, Charniak parser. So, um, so that's a problem. And then this uh, elegant uh, generalization from uh, Chomsky and linguistics, SBAR, uh, covers uh, questions, relative clauses, subordinate clauses, that clauses, and other things. And all these have different translations into the logical form. So the fact that you, know, you, you somehow recognize this elegant generalization has really uh, put you in an in a unfortunate position with respect to uh, generating the logical form. And finally, because the uh, trees are so flat, uh, you get thousands of patterns. You, know, you get, you know, verb phrase goes to verb, NP, PP, PP, uh, something adverbial, some adverbial clause, something else, something else. And, you know, the, the combinatorics of that, you know, give you thousands upon thousands of rules. Um, so uh, what we did was, first of all, well, a three-step process that, first of all, inserts lexical information from a dictionary that we compiled from... Uh, a dictionary that I had from uh, SRI's dialogic system in the 1980s, plus the uh, complex that Ralph Grishman developed at uh, <clears throat> New York University, uh, plus uh, a, um, a rather massive dictionary that Maurice Gross uh, put together for English, uh, which doesn't have a lot of information, but it does have morphological information um, tends to be very useful. Um, so the first step is to insert that lexical information and then to binarize the uh, parse tree with tree, tree transformations like rules like this, which will take uh, something like a verb phrase here, peel off the final prepositional phrase and separate that out so you get a, more of a binary tree and, uh, and thereby minimizing the number of rules that, that you're going to have to uh, cope with. And this phase also passes lexical information up the tree to uh, places where it's going to be needed for... Uh, for translation and also passes structural information down the tree. So, for example, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, John is left versus John has left. Uh, it's important again to know, you know, if, whether you've got the transitive or intransitive verb to know whether, you know, it's going to have that second argument. And um, uh, you, you don't know locally in the parse tree, you, you can't tell unless you've passed the, uh, the information down as to whether it's in the, you know, the uh, structure for the, perfect, uh, for the perfect aspect or whether it's uh, in the passive. And then uh, having done this, uh, we then generate the logical form <coughs> using um, uh, something, a software that we've developed uh, called uh, LF Toolkit or Logical Form Toolkit. The basic idea behind this uh, program is um, is that e the, the individual words in a sentence 
provide fragments of logical form. So the word lofty tells you that there's an x1 such that lofty of x1. The word towers, ignoring the plurals, tells us there's an x2 uh, such that tower of x2. And the word fall tells you that there's a falling event uh, by something x3, uh, the thing that falls. Uh, so the uh, lexical output rules of LF Toolkit produce um, essentially logical form fragments like this. And then what the composition rules in syntax, the S goes to NP, VP, the VP goes to verb NP, what they tell you is uh, identity among these variables. So when you recognize that this is an adjective that goes with this noun, that's telling you that X1 equals X2. So now you know that it's the, the tower that's lofty. And then when you recognize that this noun phrase uh, combines with this verb phrase to uh, form a sentence, that tells you that X2 is the same as X3, and that's what tells you that the, uh, the tower is what falls. Uh, so this is the basic idea behind uh, LF uh, Toolkit. It was developed by a student of mine, uh, Nishit Ratod. Uh, so here's what it produces for the uh, sentence. Uh, I have seen that the rich, proud cost of outborn, outworn buried age is defaced by time's fell hand. Uh, this is the uh, Charniak parse tree of that. And uh, what we get is that uh, there's, this <clears throat> there's this guy, uh, X2, which is described as I. Uh, there's this event in which X2 sees E7. Call that event E3. Uh, that E3 is uh, uh, in the perfect aspect, which means something like it's still relevant to the, uh, to the, to the present time. And, um, and that perfect aspect is in the present. Um, all right, then we had this, uh, this event E7, and what it is, is a defacing by somebody, we don't know yet, just from syntax, but call it X13, and it's in the, that defacing is in the present. And E7, the thing that's being defaced is E7, and that is a uh, cost, which is proud and rich, and uh, kind of mutually identifiable by the, this description. And it's of X12, which is an age, and it's outworn, and it's uh, something, something or someone, X17, buried it. Um, and furthermore, the defacing is by X15, which is a hand, and is fell, and is possessed by X18, which is time. Okay, well, I mean, some of the poetry is lost in this, <laughs> I admit. <laughs> Right, but uh, but it captures the meaning of the uh, of the uh, sentence, and then makes explicit the uh, the predicate argument relations. So it looks like X seventeen is left hanging, right? I don't see where it is. Yeah, I mean some things are left hanging. Okay. Um, and is it because you chose a particular phrase I mean, for buried? Yeah, I mean buried is uh, is in the passive, which means that something is some agent is burying this thing. And we're not told what, what's burying it. We might be able to figure that out when we start doing inferences. Uh, but, we, but, we, but the syntax doesn't tell us. I was wondering whether there was another frame of body where there would not be an explicit actor. You can take any uh, passive verb form and treat it as an adjective if you want to. But it seems to me more interesting. I mean, you know, I mean, we, we in fact might find out uh, what it is that's burying, um, burying the age. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know how much you want to talk about uh, LF Toolkit and the particular logical forms that you're getting here. So go, go, yeah, go ahead. If I don't want to talk about it, I'll refuse to answer. Sorry? If I don't want to talk about it, I'll refuse to answer. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so, so I would have thought that uh, the particular scheme that you're talking about is, is too simple to work. In that when I teach compositional semantics, I have all these lambda terms and Montague types. Yeah. Terms. I mean, the function of lambda terms, look, lambda, what, what lambda, um, what function application does in, in categorical grammar is identify variables. That's all it does, right? So when I'm, when in, in um, when I'm identifying these variables here, yeah, I mean, I could say, all right, this is a function that applies to something that's generated some logical form fragment in lambda calculus that's, that's generated here. But all that's going to happen up here when I apply the functions is that these variables get identified. And it seems to me it's just, it's just bonkers to, uh, to use this heavy-duty formalism when, uh, 
when you can when the idea behind it is really so simple. Um, I, I can see how you might be able to do a transformation for things like quantification. Uh, I'm not. I'd, I'd have to try to write something down to convince myself it goes through, but it does go through. Uh, you end up having some uh, uh, some, some uh, small predicates that say that some variable is quantified by something else, and then that variable is. Uh, yeah, I mean you're right. You're right. I mean what, what I gener the logical forms I generate are are uh, flat conjunctions of. Um, of um, atomic propositions that are, that are existentially quantified on all the variables. So the quantifier structure that's there has to be represented by kind of reifying universally quantified variables as to kind of type elements that have properties that are inherited by the elements of the set, and that gets quite complicated. And so that's something, so that's something I won't describe in greater detail. Is there any problem in recognizing quantifier scope or...? Yeah, so you can't recognize quantifier scope in syntax anyway. I, I, it's, I, it's, something, I it's something you have... So what I try to do is generate a, a logical form that is uh, neutral with respect to scope, and then that may, it may be one of the, these functional dependencies of one variable on another are something that you may or may not discover in the course of your inferencing. Good. I, I like that. So now I want to look at the uh, various problems of co-reference. Uh, there are some easy cases. Uh, one is this uh, time, time. I mean, they're two proper names, and uh, um, you know, they're pretty, pretty straightforward to recognize. They have identical descriptions. Similarly, the I here, the I here, I, I, me, my. Uh, down here, uh, this thought, you know, you'd like to know that it's a thought of mine as opposed to a thought of my lover or a thought of some other random person. Um, <clears throat> that would require some sort of inference that, uh, for example, to know that if X thinks Y, then X is a person. But that still doesn't solve it because we have two people, two, well, one person for sure, which is my. Uh, my love might also be a person. I mean, it might be my car because, um, you know, people can love anything. But, uh, but it could be a person. And uh, so maybe it's a thought of the person. So that's a little harder. Uh, this it, uh, an algorithm that I proposed back in seven, 1976, <clears throat> would resolve this to uh, say that it's identical with the which, whatever which refers to. And which refers to, well, that depends on how you attach it, whether it's attached to death or, or thought. And, uh, and that's ambiguous. Uh, but it's a fairly benign ambiguity because the thought is at least similar to death, if not identical to it. Uh, I mean, the thought is as a death. Um, <clears throat> so you would at least almost get the right reference of, uh, of it by a fairly simple means. Uh, there are harder cases that you need to do some uh, measure of inferencing for. So uh, when I've seen the hungry ocean gain advantage on the kingdom of the shore and the firm soil win of the watery main increasing store with loss and loss with store, you'd like to know that the ocean and the main are the same. Um, now, one of the major resources that people use in, um, in trying to do inferencing in natural language is WordNet. And uh, Sanda Harabaju and uh, Dan Moldovan at uh, Language Computer Corporation uh, translated the, uh, the glosses in WordNet, or the definitions of the words, into uh, predicate calculus axioms and uh, uh, reported substantial success using these for, um, for, um, for doing inferencing and question answering. So suppose we, have, uh, suppose we can do the same sort of thing. Um, then uh, we look at the WordNet glosses for ocean and for main ocean is a large body of water constituting the Earth's hydrosphere, or something like that. Uh, Maine is a very, in a particu this particular sense, is a very large body of uh, salt water. So these uh, are pretty straightforward, I would think, to uh, match with each other. And you could figure out that the ocean and the Maine are probably the same thing. You'd also like to figure out that the shore and the soil, or the soil is at least part of the shore, or on the shore, or, or is the shore. Um, so we look at the, uh, the, word, the glosses for that, and we get tantalizingly close. 
And a lot of the cases where I'm looking in, where I look in WordNet for, uh, for the linkage that I want, I, you know, I get tantalizingly close, but not quite there. So in this case, uh, the shore is the land along the edge of a body of water. Uh, you look up land and it says it's the solid part of the Earth's surface. Solid is not soft or yielding to pressure. You look up soil and you say the part of the Earth's surface consisting of humus and rock, and a rock is a lump or mass of hard consolidated material. Now, if only you knew that soft and hard were, um, were uh, antonyms, then maybe you would have enough there to, uh, to make that linkage and realize that the soil and the shore are the same thing. But uh, at the time I first looked at this, um, these were not, not then coded as antonyms um, in, um, in WordNet. Now, Christian Feldbaum has seen a copy of these slides, so uh, she may have added that into WordNet now. I don't know. Um, sorry? Yes? Isn't it firm soil that it showed? What happened to firm? Um, yeah, no, right, yeah, firm soil, right. Um, but in a way, the firm and the soil are uh, highly redundant. I well, mean, firm in this case is a non-restricted adjective. So it's, uh, it's the soil, comma, which is firm. Yeah, right. It's not firm soil as distinguished from yeah. some other kind of soil. Well, so, 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 so. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's true. You might be able to chase through a line on uh, firm and get something that matches up somewhere that you would get with, uh, with shore. It, that, that's possible. I didn't do that. Um, all right, then we have these um, uh, last four lines. Ruin hath taught me thus to ruminate, that time will come and take my love away. This thought, of, this thought of mine is as a death which cannot choose but weep that which it fears to lose. So um, you'd like to know, well, first of all, the syntax. Suppose you were able to handle this inversion and, and, uh, and you got ruin hath taught me to ruminate thus, comma, the time will come and take my love away. So you recognize that this clause here is in a positive on thus. Um, then, uh, and, and is the object of ruminate. Then um, a thought, of course, if, if X, a thought is a Y such that X thinks Y. So it's the object of think. And then if I can link up ruminate and think, uh, then I should be able to, uh, to recognize the, uh, the co-reference here of, of the me and the mind, the implicit mind, the thought, and the, and the thing that is ruminated. Um, and as it happens, uh, ruminate is in WordNet is in the same sin set as a number of other things, including think over, although not think. Uh, and maybe you'd be happy with think over. Maybe that's enough to, uh, uh, to get you the, uh, the uh, linkage. Uh, there's also a non-co-reference problem here, um, and you know it would be uh, curious. I, I, it would be very unlikely that any technique uh, used today that could get the other examples of uh, co-reference uh, would not all, would not make a mistake on this, right? I mean, it's important. It's an important part of understanding the poem here to know that these two states are not the same, and in fact, don't mean the same thing. Um, so when I have seen such interchange of state, here we mean state in the fourth sense in WordNet, which is the way something is with respect to its main attributes, kind of the abstract state that we're familiar with. Solid and, and liquid. Sorry? In this case, solid and liquid. Well, um, if you wanted to interpret it literally with, with respect to the previous example, yeah, but I mean, I think... It, in this case, I think it, it means something much more general. Um, and um, our state confound, itself confounded to decay, where this state means, I would have thought it meant, and, and certainly the closest sense in WordNet is a politically organized body of people under a single government. Uh, but in the footnotes of the, uh, of the book that I have, uh, says that oh, in, uh, what Shakespeare meant by state was uh, majesty or royalty or uh, splendor. It's close to the, the current meaning of state, but it's uh, a bit different, but certainly different from the uh, first state. All right, the next area is um, interpreting predicate argument relations. 
And um, so the, uh, the kinds of issues that arise here are uh, a kind of vivification or predicate strengthening that we want to do when we encounter uh, the uh, vague predicates that, that just pervade uh, natural language discourse. So, so one of them is the uh, concept of of. If I say the wall of a tower, in order to really understand this word of, we have to know that in this context, it means that uh, the wall is part of the tower. Uh, other examples of such uh, vague predicates are, um, are the possessive, or the, the word have, or the word at, uh, or um, the, uh, the implicit relation between the nouns and a compound nominal. So in a combustion engine, what's the relation between combustion and engine? Um, and so um, an important part of understanding um, uh, a discourse is understanding these vague predicates. Uh, then there's the, the issue of metonymy. So when we say we read Shakespeare, what we really mean is something like we read the plays of Shakespeare, we read the poetry of Shakespeare. And again, this is pervasive in natural language. You know, does this restaurant take American Express? Well, you know, it's not going to take over the company American Express. I mean, certainly, you know, what you mean is take, does it take credit cards issued by American Express? Um, there's metaphor, uh, time marches on, means that time shares, well, only people can march, and so uh, uh, time must have some aspect in similar, that's similar to an aspect that people have, and in this case, it would be motion. Uh, and then there's predicate loosening or hyperbole. So time flies, you really mean time moves fast, and you want to somehow tap into your knowledge that uh, if something flies, then it's moving fast. Um, <clears throat> And my argument here is that with the right knowledge and the right choice function, uh, both of those are huge problems. Uh, but if you had those two, then uh, these problems could be solved. Um, so here's uh, the idea in uh, interpretation is abduction, I mean, is that uh, the way we understand the world is we kind of do this inference process called abduction, which is inference to the best explanation where we try to find the best explanation for the observables. And in this view, the, the observables in the text are its logical form, and what we have to do, the explanation is a proof of it. Uh, but there's going to be new information in the uh, text, and so we're not going to be able to prove it completely, but we're allowed to make assumptions. And then we have a cost function on, that, um, on the proofs that tells us which the best proof is. So here's an example of a wall of the tower. So there's a wall X and a tower Y, and X is of Y. And suppose we know in our knowledge base that if uh, X is part of Y, then X is of Y. That is, part of is one possible specialization of of. Uh, that buildings have walls that are part of them, and that a tower is a building. Uh, then we can assume that there's a tower, and that from that we conclude that there's a building and therefore there's a wall, and that gives us this. And, uh, and that wall is part of the tower, and that part of the tower can be realized by the more abstract predicate of that appears here. So we have a, we have a proof, and it's fairly economical proof because it only required us to uh, make this one uh, assumption. And it solves as a byproduct. It uh, gives us this, uh, the, uh, the predicate strengthening that we wanted for of. Uh, here's an example of metonymy. Um, let's see how. To, so I read Shakespeare. So I'm reading this X. No, I'm sorry. Somebody X is reading. Is uh, there's a reading event E uh, by somebody of uh, Shakespeare. Uh, let's see how to go through this. So. So this this is essentially the way you do syntax, and it's kind of like uh, feature uh, structures in, uh, in uh, uh, head-driven phrase structure grammar. Uh, but basically, this says if E is a reading event by X of Z, so X is reading Z and E is that event, then you can describe E by the word read, providing you find something in the subject position that describes X and something in the object position that describes Z. And it's when we do these compositions like this that we find the uh, the right arguments. Now, this is where the metonymy happens. What this says is, 
that if I'm using, if I want to express some relation to z here, and y is somehow related to z, then I can, I can describe y instead. Okay, so instead of talking about the plays of Shakespeare or the poetry of Shakespeare, I can just refer to Shakespeare himself. Um, and so we have, but that means we have to find some relation between, all right, now this text is a uh, constraint on uh, the use of the word read. The thing that you read has to be a text. Now suppose we know that uh, Shakespeare wrote poetry. This writing gives us the relation we need between Shakespeare and the poetry. And this tells us that uh, poetry is a text. So we, uh, we uh, get the right uh, metonymic interpretation that, uh, that what, I, what I read here is not Shakespeare, why, but the poetry of Shakespeare, Z, uh, where, the, where the coercion was, uh, was uh, the writing relation. A couple of notes about metonymy. Uh, metonymy operates not on words but on predicate argument structures. So in, I like to read Shakespeare who lived in Elizabethan times. Uh, we don't want to say, you know, I like to read, oh, it's, I got a course, the poetry of Shakespeare and the poetry of Shakespeare lived in Elizabethan times. That doesn't work. It was Shakespeare, the person that lived in Elizabethan times. Um, so it's really, the metonymy really operates on the predicate argument relations, and we have two here, the I read Shakespeare, and Shakespeare lives in Elizabethan times. This one we have to coerce into I read the poetry of Shakespeare. In this one, there's no coercion. And the second uh, point is that metonymy is an interpretive move that's always available whether or not there's a selectional violation. So uh, Elizabeth I was a voracious theater goer. She especially liked Shakespeare. Now, it's, it's not a um, selectional violation for her to like a person, and maybe she, in fact, did like a person, but, you know, in this context, probably we mean that she likes the plays of Shakespeare, uh, even though there's no selectional violation on I like Shakespeare or she likes Shakespeare. Um, metaphor can be handled in the abductive uh, framework uh, <coughs> by... Okay, so here's, here's time marches, and um, what's going on here is, a, is really a kind of coercion as well. So we're saying in general, that suppose E2 is a, a marching event by X. Uh, then we can use the word marches to describe it. And then here's where the coercion happens. We say, well, instead of using, uh, instead of... Um, Instead of, instead of marches describing E2, I'm going to use marches to describe E1, which is related to E2. And I'm going to tap into this knowledge that uh, marching is a moving. Um, so E1 now, the claim of the sentence now becomes that E1 is the, uh, is the uh, rather, sorry, the claim is now E1, which is the moving rather than marching. So. So uh, time marches on as uh, really time moves on in some sense. I mean, that's another metaphor that we have to interpret as well, but yeah. Do you add this imply predicate to everything? Well, in fact, I do. I mean, I leave it out in examples on slides that don't need it. But, uh, but in fact, I, I do put something like that in, into every uh, axiom, and then you can explicitly refer to the implication relation between these, and it is the implication relation that provides the coercion from the marching to the, uh, to the moving. Um, the predicate loosening is a very similar, in fact, it's exactly the same story where we're loosening it, uh, the interpretation for time flies from time flies to, uh, to time moves fast, where the coercion is, again, the implication relation. So now I want to look at the various predicate argument relations in the, uh, in the poem. Uh, these, in the first two lines, these are the, um, the relations that we have. <clears throat> so when I have seen by time's fell hand deface the rich proud cost of outworn buried age, uh, we have this I see a defacement. Well, there's no problem there because persons can see uh, states and events. So uh, let's let that pass. A hand, um, the hand is defacing the cost. Uh, well, that doesn't make sense as is. We have to coerce 
uh, the hand into the owner of the hand, something capable of some kind of agency, um, and then uh, coerce that into the effects of uh, time's actions. Well, the only thing time can do is pass. Uh, so kind of the effects of passage of time uh, is what uh, time's hand gets uh, um, coerced into. For cost, we have to coerce that into artifacts of high cost. And now we have an, that an agent or an a event like time's passage can, defects, uh, can deface artifacts, and that's fine. That, that kind of goes through. Uh, time's hand, uh, we would like to strengthen the possessive to kind of body part of. Uh, we have to interpret uh, time metaphorically as a person on the basis of the shared property with a person that, uh, that uh, they can cause change. And um, similarly, uh, f the fell hand, well, fell means kind of causing destruction. So we have to uh, coerce the hand into the action of the, co of the owner of the hand, which is time. Uh, and so again, we get the, uh, the change causes, caused by uh, time, uh, time's passage. Uh, in uh, cost, as uh, the cost is rich and the cost is proud, we have to coerce cost into one who pays the cost and infer from that that it's a high cost because uh, the one who pays the cost is rich and proud. Um, the, the cost of uh, the age is uh, we have to strengthen that to originating in this time period, in a time period, uh, and then coerce cost to the artifacts of high cost as we, as we did up here. Um, <clears throat> so now it becomes uh, artifacts of high cost uh, originating in the time period of this age. Uh, and then the buried and outworn age, we again have to uh, coerce age to objects originating in the age, which is, is um, you know, kind of the same as the artifacts originating in the time period. So on the one hand, there's a lot of work we have to do in metonymic and interpretation and strengthening uh, relations and so on. But on the other hand, we have a very high degree of redundancy that kind of allows us to kind of hone in on uh, uh, particular relations. Um, in the, uh, so the next two lines, when, I, when sometime lofty towers I see down raised and brass eternal slave to mortal rage, uh, all of these um, uh, relations are, uh, are okay. They, they don't violate anything. Uh, here we get uh, the brass is slave to rage, and we have to coerce rage into the destruction that rage causes, uh, loosen slave to, to something like controlled by, uh, and then mortal rage. Mortal is a, a one of these noun-like adjectives, which really means, well, it has something to do with death. So it's kind of like a, a compound nominal. It's as though we said death rage. And you have to figure out what the relation between uh, death and rage is, and so we want to, we have this NN relation that we want to that we want to strengthen somehow, and we'll strengthen it to causes, namely, I guess the rage causes death. Uh, so we coerce uh, rage into a death caused by rage, and we get that the uh, the death caused by rage uh, causes uh, destruction to the uh, to the brass. Yeah. Um, that's one interpretation of it, I think. Yeah. Well, an another one might be, which is, which shows that this is under constraint, that uh, the mortal is to be contrasted with eternal, so the rage is the rage of mortals who are only ephemeral, and yet they can destroy the eternal things. Oh, that's very good. Yeah. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> I almost so like that better. Are, right, so... Uh, Rather than always having mortal uh, to do with death, then you would also have to liken it with you know things whose uh, distinguishing property is the ability to die. Right. Or the property of and overcome such weak things can overcome even something as eternal as brass. Yeah, that's nice. Uh, the next one: uh, When I have seen the hungry ocean gain advantage on the kingdom of the shore and the firm soil, win of the watery main, the uh, 
So gain advantage, the ocean gaining advantage on the kingdom of the shore. We have to loosen kingdom to a region ruled. Well, a kingdom is a region ruled by a king, so forget the king and just f focus on the region. Um, to gain advantage on is to increase a scale or quantity with respect to, uh, so we increase in relative size with respect to uh, the hungry ocean. Uh, the ocean is interpreted metaphorically as animate and therefore it's consuming something and therefore there's going to be a smaller amount left and that corresponds to that basically conveys the same thing as increase in relative size with respect to uh, this kingdom of the shore, the region of the shore, the of is we have to figure out is the of of identity like the city of Baltimore. Um, and the firm soil, well these, these two are okay. Um, so we get um, the interpretation of those. Um, when I have seen such interchange of state or state itself confounded to decay, let me look at uh, the uh, something is confounding uh, the state into decay. So it's caused by confounding uh, the, the, the decaying of the state. Uh, confounding is uh, to confound something is to make orderly structures more chaotic. Uh, decay is the loss of structure and a structured entity. Uh, state as a governmental body is a, uh, or as a system of procedures in a hierarchical system, is a, a structured entity. So what we're saying is that there's something that is uh, causing uh, us to lose this, uh, lose structure in this structured entity of uh, the state. Um, ruin, ruin hath taught me thus to ruminate that time will come and take my love away. Um, so in the uh, time will come, uh, this is a personification based on the motion of the time or of, human, of, of a human uh, personification of time. Uh, we have to interpret here as uh, uh, this uh, argument of you know, the destination of the coming as uh, here where I am. <clears throat> but we can get that from both the, uh, the presuppositions of come and also the enabling conditions of taking something away. If you're going to take something away from me, you have to come to where I am in order to do it. Um, and again, time is, uh, well, all right, so then time takes my love from me. Um, we have to, uh, well, t uh, taking is a change from I have my love to I don't have my love. Uh, then we have to strengthen have to be in some sort of reciprocal relationship with. And uh, time, again, is coerced into the passage of time and the events that occupy it. So all this is what's doing the, uh, the uh, uh, affecting the change from my being in this relationship with my love to my not being in it. Uh, in what sense do I possess my love for in my love? Uh, well, I have to strengthen the possession relation to the predicate argument relation. I mean, the, my love is the X such that I love X. And we have to get that that's what the relation between I, you know, this love relation is the relation between I and X. That's the strengthening of the possession. And the other, the other predicate argument relations are uh, unproblematic there, or less problematic. Um, and then finally, and that time will come and take my love away. This thought is as a death which cannot choose but weep to have that which it fears to lose. Um, we have to figure out what the similarity is between the thought and the death. Uh, well, they're similar in kind of the dread one feels. Cannot choose but weep. We have to figure out that this you know, Shakespearean phraseology is uh, something like cannot choose not to weep. Uh, that is, must weep. Um, if for a thought to weep, we have to coerce that into the thinker. Uh, we have to interpret, we have to, this, this is another bit of Shakespearean phraseology that we, uh, to have, we have to interpret as, so weep at having that which it fears to lose. And the at then gets uh, um, interpreted or strengthened to the, uh, the uh, causal, to kind of a causality or causal relation. So, and I knew at a glance, the glance causes me to know. And similarly, we have uh, the having causes me to weep. Um, again, the fear, 
uh, the thought fears to lose. It's really the thinker that fears to lose. People can fear events, so that's okay. And the thought loses something. Well, a losing is a change from having something to not having it. Um, and this, in fact, is the same interpretation as we got from this take up here. And so if we recognize those as describing the same event, uh, then uh, we figure out that what's, what's, what's at issue here, what's going to be lost, is uh, my love. So um, next I want to look at, so that, that was the, actually the bulk of the, uh, uh, the detailed analysis, and the next uh, few things are, uh, don't, are, aren't, I won't go into as much detail. Um, there are a number of coherence relations that happen between the eventualities, the states and events that uh, are, are described in discourse. And um, <clears throat> uh, typically these relations are things like uh, causality or their negation. So something like time passed and the pages became worn and yellow, where the first clause provides the cause for the second. Time had passed, but she looked as beautiful as ever. Uh, where you'd expect some causality, but there's not. Um, uh, similarity and its negation in contrast and instances of general principles. So the paintings were flaking and the statues were cracked. So this is a kind of similarity there. The wall had collapsed, but the statue was still standing. Uh, there's a contrast there because the, of a lack of similarity that you might expect. Uh, there's an occasion relation between uh, eventualities where one uh, sets up the occasion for another or kind of sets up a change of state. So I turned to the third act and began to read. I really couldn't begin to read the third act until I turned to it. Um, there's the figure ground and ground figure relation. The field spread out before us. It was filled with soldiers. And um, then predicate argument relations. Uh, Pat didn't like Hamlet. I don't understand that. Or you're making a predication in the second. Uh, sentence about the entity introduced in the first or the, the uh, situation described in the first. So we get a lot of these um, coherence relations inside uh, internal to clauses uh, and that's what in fact makes it uh, such uh, a dense uh, poem. Uh, so when I've seen by time's fell hand there's defaced, the time is really the cause of the defacing. So we have a kind of implicit causal relation here. Uh, defacing is an instance of being fell, so there's a strong relation here between the fell and the defaced. Um, there's a causal relation between the time and some time and the being down raised, uh, because it is time that uh, knocks these towers down. And then we have a contrast that runs through the uh, first four uh, lines <clears throat> between uh, a contrast between valuable and intact things and things getting broken. So we have the uh, rich proud cost and the lofty towers and the brass eternal. And, uh, and we have the broken, you know, things getting broken, the fell, defaced, the outworn, buried, downraged, a slave to mortal rage. We have a causal relation between hungry and gaining since it's the hunger that causes the, uh, the consuming that gains. We have a contrast between the firm soil and the watery main. Um, and we have a causal relation down here. It's the fear that causes him to weep. And you'd think that having something good would uh, cause you not to weep, but in fact, we have a violation of that causal relation in the, uh, the having, in fact, doesn't, uh, the having, in fact, causes you to weep rather than not to weep. So we get those kinds of clause internal coherence relations, and then there's the interclausal uh, coherence structure. Um, so again, for the first four lines, what we have is the uh, same internal contrasts uh, leading to recognition of interclausal um, parallelism. So basically what both of the, so there, there's basically three, set, three statements here in these four lines. Uh, all of which are instances of the idea that I see, I see that time causes intact and valuable things to break. So we have the intact, rich, proud cost and the breaking, defacing and outworn, buried age. The uh, intact and valuable lofty towers, breaking or down raised, brass eternal, etc. 
So that's a poem about entropy. Um, we get a contrast here between um, the ocean gaining on the land when I've seen the hungry ocean gain advantage on the kingdom of the shore and also and the uh, land gaining on the ocean and the firm soil wind of the watery main. Um, this line is fairly uh, complicated uh, but my analysis of it is that increasing store with loss this store means the ocean so store means an x such that x has the ocean has x um, so this is the ocean increasing the ocean with the loss of the land and it's modifying this gaining and the, the hungry ocean gaining advantage on the shore uh, this clause here the loss with store well we have to fill in the, the increasing loss with store uh, the loss refers to the loss of the ocean and the gain of the land and uh, it, it modifies the winning the firm soil winning of the watery main so we get kind of a, a respectively you know this modifies this and this modifies uh, this so the uh, this the structure we get from uh, from this much of the from these lines are that we have this uh, that 8a elaborates on 5 and 6 and 8b elaborates on 7 or you could restructure this and say that we have the contrast between 5, 5, 6, and 7, and we have the contrast between 8a and 8b, and these two things are elaborations because they're both expressing contrasts between the same sorts of things. Um, lines 9 and 10, well, the first eight lines, the summary of that would be, I see that time causes intact and valuable things to break. And now I, now I see, uh, when I've seen such interchange of state, well, we have to figure out that the such interchange of state is, is the breakage of these valuable things, uh, or state itself confounded to decay. What's happening in both of these uh, clauses is that things are changing for the worse. And that's kind of a summary of this uh, first eight lines. And a summary is a kind of variety of elaboration. It's kind of a reverse variety of, of elaboration. Uh, then I have um, uh, nine, sentence uh, nine, I mean sentence, uh, line 11. Uh, Ruin hath taught me thus to ruminate that oh, the time will come and take my love away. Um, 11 and 12. Where ruin, in fact, refers to the first 10 lines of the poem. Uh, that's what's being described there. It's a kind of uh, large scale co reference problem. Um, now, the summary of those uh, first 10 lines where I see time causes intact and valuable things to break, and that really lines up perfectly with this uh, sentence that uh, the I is uh, like me, uh, C is a, is a, a cognitive uh, action like ruminating is. Uh, time uh, causes is implicit in the will come uh, and also in the take. Uh, intact and valuable is, well, an instance of that is my love. And, uh, the, the breakage is uh, the breakage of my bond with uh, my love. Uh, so you can see all of this as a kind of instance of this general principle. So what's going on here is that in the first 10 lines, I've observed a general principle, and now I'm saying that this causes me to conclude this particular instance of that. Um, and the causality is also explicitly signaled by the when up here that is repeated often in the, uh, in the taught, sort of a cause to learn. And then finally, in the uh, last uh, few lines, so I had this uh, observation I made of the, uh, a general principle, and that led me to, that caused me to conclude this instance, that time is going to come and take my love away. Uh, this causes an emotional response to this instant, namely fear, and this causes uh, this emotional response to that emotion, namely weeping. So we get this kind of causal chain in the last few uh, lines of the poem. So the total coherence structure that we get for the entire poem is we, we had these parallelisms built up in the uh, first uh, stanza and this, uh, these contrasts between 5, 6, and 7 and between 8a and 8b, and they were the same contrast of... Uh, of the same sorts of entities, so we get this kind of elaboration. So we get these uh, parallel or similar uh, statements about uh, 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 intact things falling apart. 
And then we get a summary of that in uh, lines uh, uh, 9 and 10 that are two similar statements of, of things falling apart in a general sense. And then we get causal relations to uh, lines 11 and 12 and from there to, uh, to uh, 12 and 13. Uh, there are some things that are missing from this analysis. Um, so, for example, um, I didn't say anything about the, the displacements for, uh, that uh, Shakespeare did for, for rhythm and rhyme. I mean, it would be a very much poorer poem if he hadn't done that, if he had said, when I, see, when I have seen the rich, proud cost of outworn, buried age defaced by time's fell hand. You know, already it's, uh, we, we've lost something. Um, and it's very difficult to see how you know, we in our current technology would begin to capture something, uh, some, a phenomenon like this, the sense that we get. Uh, there's a very nice, well, and similarly, the brass eternal versus and eternal brass. Um, there's an interesting uh, device here where he breaks the line in mid-idiom, forcing a decomposition, uh, so, and, and forcing you to focus on the word gain. Uh, instead of simply glomming it together into gain advantage of. The uh, most interesting example I saw of this kind of break was in a newspaper where I was just looking, it was, this was back in the early 80s, and uh, the newspaper was folded and the headline was, um, South African Prime Minister Declines Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, this was in the era of apartheid. Uh, when, the, when the South African Prime Minister was an absolute brute. Uh, and I thought, this can't be. <laughs> you know? And I picked up the newspaper and opened it up, and I saw the rest of the headline, which was, Desmond, no, winner, winner Desmond Tutu's request for meeting. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, you know, it's this kind of thing where you read up to the end of the line, you get one interpretation, you read on beyond that, and it forces a new interpretation. And we get something like that here. Uh, the, rep the repetition and the par paradox in this uh, increasing store with loss and loss with store. Uh, the repetition here with a uh, change in meaning. Uh, there's an interesting hidden echo here between ruin and ruminate. Uh, and I think the effect of this depends in part on the, on the low frequency of the uh, syllable RU in English. Um, so these are just some of the things that, uh, that are missed by this kind of analysis. So a summary of all this analysis is that we have a dense network of metonymy, metaphor, predicate strengthening and loosening, parallelisms, contrast, causal relations. In each individual case, the uh, computational account is possible. A lot of knowledge is required, but mostly it's lexical or near lexical nature, uh, uh, knowledge. Uh, uh, nature of knowledge. Uh, there's no deep esoteric knowledge. You don't have to know, you know, um, where Shakespeare was born or, or who uh, Queen Elizabeth's prime minister was or uh, you don't have to know. Any, you know, it's all, it's all stuff that you might expect to find in a dictionary, not stuff that you'd have to go to a, a, um, 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 a, a dictionary or pre-dictionary in a way or uh, you know, what you have to know in order to read a dictionary. Uh, you don't have to go to an encyclopedia for it. Uh, the right paths through the inference space would have to be found, and that's a, uh, a very hard problem in uh, this kind of knowledge-based or inference-based natural language processing. Uh, but on the other hand, the implicit redundancies that are just pervade the analysis of this poem would help you narrow in on the, uh, the right choices because every time you you um, find one of these redundancies, you're getting a more economical interpretation uh, and, uh, and therefore a better interpretation in uh, the abduction picture of things. So um, I gave this talk at um, LREC last year in uh, Genoa, and one of the responses from a colleague was, you haven't even begun to scratch the, the, the surface of Shakespeare. If this were the work of a college sophomore, I'd give it an A minus. So I thought, hmm, college sophomore, A minus, by a computer. <laughs> That's okay.
Any further questions or comments? Yeah, David. Okay, so, uh, well, <clears throat> be somewhat contrarian, the, the sentiment in this poem is rather conventional, as are most of the, a lot of the sentiments in, in Shakespeare's sonnets, but that could be a good thing, because the job of an Elizabethan poet is to take rather conventional sentiment and turn it into a, a work of art. Right. So, uh, if you, you know, the, this poem could be attached to, uh, to a, a, an engraving in an emblem book that shows a half-raised tower or something right. like that, and many people could have written poems on it, or for example, Keith, uh, you know, both Shelley and his friend wrote poems on Ozymandias, and right. one was good. Uh, <laughs> uh, could that be a way into uh, this this sort of thing that is left out of your analysis? Uh, you mean that one of the things that you'd want to do is recognize what conventional point uh, is, right. there, is being there's, made there's here. A conventional declarative knowledge, which is, you know, you know. So everything happens. falls apart. Everything right. good ends. Right. right. And, and if that's part of your knowledge, then, then you'd like to uh, somehow link this poem up with that. Right. And, and there's, 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 you think that piece of conventional knowledge are various uh, expressions of uh, poetic beauty. Uh, you could compare the, these expressions. Well, in a way, yeah. Okay. All right. So the idea is that uh, you have this kind of schema, these this set of this set of schemas for uh, you know the kinds of things people write poems about, and one of these schemas is all good things have to end, and uh, and so we're just going to read this poem, analyze this poem with respect to that schema, and see how well it fits. And we say, lofty tower is good. You know, defaced and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And we you know go down the list, and sure enough, uh, it matches things pretty well. Um, yeah, I mean that's a that's a uh, uh, that would be another take on it, right? Uh, yeah. I wonder if um, there's uh, something of the, of comparable. Uh, formal structure to be said about all the uh, all, all that is conveyed by the choice of the poet to use metonymy, to use metaphor, to use strengthening uh, at the points where it's used. So it's one thing to translate, right. you know, sort of undo. Undo the undo, undo that. Yeah. But it's another thing to somehow appreciate what it was that was, it was achieved. Done. Right by doing it the way that it was done and not by the translation of um, right. And I, I don't know what kind of information you would consider that to be and how you would want to, to encode it and what you would want to do with it. And yeah, I mean, computationally, what would that uh, amount to, right? I mean, I mean, it's pretty straightforward to say metonymy, aha, uh -huh, metaphor. Um, but to uh, to kind of Right, I mean, I have a feeling that our appreciation of, of the fact that he's used a metonymy or metaphor here it goes a lot deeper than that, than just saying, aha, metonymy. Right, right, and, it, and deeper than what it is that you translate this metonymy yeah, into. Yeah, right. Um, but I don't know how much, uh, how much formal content can be attributed to those aspects of the, of the choice of language. So, um, I mean, if, if yeah, if, I mean the way I would phrase it is, the word, if you use the word store uh -huh. to accomplish what you did, why use that word to do it? Right. What what is in there, and how to express it? Right. Yeah. Uh, right. I mean that's that's definitely something, and it's hard to figure out, hard to hard to uh, think of how, if you were to capture it, what what that would amount to. You know, computationally. Yeah. Um, I had a, a, I guess, kind of general question. Um, in basically, there, there's a lot of rhetorical work being done in this poem. Yeah. Um, one particular piece which you didn't really focus on is, especially between 
was it's lines eight and nine, there's kind of a, a, a double chiasmus. Um, you have line eight, there's internal chiasmus, right. store right. loss, right. loss, store, loss, loss, store. Um, but you also have basically lines four and five. You know, four and five are you know part A, line seven is B, and then you have A B mm -hmm. in the eighth line. And then when you look at lines nine and ten, you have line nine. I, b b instead of having this A B A B, mm -hmm. um, if you take the first four lines as A, second four lines as B, it gets switched in lines nine and ten as far as what they refer to. So I've seen this interchange of state is you know ocean goes to shore, shore goes to ocean. Right. Um, state compounded to decay is Refers you know, to lofty to towers falling, yeah, all yeah, this right, stuff. Right. Um, and you know, b b because that is you know the sort of rhetorical trope that sort of you know puts an exclamation mark here. Mm -hmm. It says you know, th this is an important break, um, and that is also used to show uh, there's this transition from oh I'm talking about some stuff here. Talking well, it's at the it. conventional. It's at the conventional yeah. point. At the, um, after I, I I guess my point is, do you see sort of use of rhetoric. You know, sort of identifying, say, ah, I see chiasmus here, therefore, just sort of using rhetoric in order to deal with these kind of interclausal um, relationships in order to better, you know. I mean, that would be a nice it. thing to be able to recognize. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, right. Um, and I would think that, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I really haven't thought of uh, how, how a, you know, what a formal treatment of, uh, of that would look like. I mean, I would think it would be somewhere in the, uh, in the coherence structure that you're recognizing kind of the, the details of the uh, content of this particular segment um, that, that you get this kind of reversal. Because I can also see what I mean, kind of the, you're talking about the trinac parts are having problems with store with loss, loss with store. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you had some addendum, you know, in your grand or somewhere that knew about chiasmus, so it would say, ah, that looks like that. Mm -hmm. You don't kind of know how to break it up. Yeah. And so, you know. Right. So there, are, there are lexical cues, right? Because it, you, it says, seen such interchange of state. So this is now summarizing, because such as what? Yeah, you, yeah, you, need, to know, you need to know that this is an instruction to, or, uh, yeah, yeah. to you know, find, the, uh, like find out what refers, what the co-reference relation is. And then is. by the same token same has taught me thus. to yeah, really And this yeah. thought. Yeah. yeah. So I, I had what's, I guess, more of an observation. One thing that struck me when you showed the um, coherent structure for the, for the whole poem was um, you know, it's one of these strongly left branching kinds of structures, which right. is kind of opposite what you see in language. But actually, it reminded me of um, in the early 80s, um, Lairdahl and Jackendorf did a, a generative theory of, of tonal music. And it's exactly the kinds of structures you get all over tonal music. So you have, uh, you have this big, uh, big block off to the left that's sort of mm -hmm. this prolongation of, you know, the tonality and then you have a big cadence at the end, which is sort of the, you know, sort of the big satisfying closure to the whole piece. And that's just the way tone music works. And presumably right. that's because of some, it works that way because we have some innate disposition to enjoy structures like that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this just reminded me that uh, maybe these structures are sort of inherently aesthetically pleasing to us. That could be. I mean, it's certainly uh, the structure you'd expect mostly in, um, in uh, sonnets, for example, where you know you have this long development and then kind of the punchline at the end. Right, right. Cer certainly. So, um, I mean, I, I so that you know made me uh, wonder if you could sort of impose a certain amount of top-down uh, sort of a, a preference for structures like this, if that would sort of guide your your you know reconstruction of what you anticipate uh, if you're trying to put together a graph like this. Right. You yeah. Might, might get some guideposts by <coughs> by sort of taking that as a as a starting point rather than sort of the. And I, yeah, and I suspect surprise. that would work pretty well in um, in the sonnets, mm -hmm. for example. Uh, Jim. Yeah, I'd like to bring the room down for a minute. What's the status of LF Toolkit? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can download it if you want. Uh, it, it doesn't come yet with the uh, our latest version of the translators, but uh, that should happen in the next month or two. Just so
Sorry? Just off the ISI site? Uh, just go to my website and one of the first links. I'm sorry, how much of this was done with the toolkit? How much was this done by a person? Oh, up to the logical form was uh, was done by with the Cherniak parser and the logical and the LF toolkit. Okay. So we generated logical form and I, I was gonna count up and see you know what the statistics were. Basically it got six of ten sentences completely correct and you know got about uh, 80 80 percent of the propositions correct. And then from there, it's kind of the structure. And then, and then from there, it's just, it's just a, a manual, you know. But that, that's the kind of direction you're going to take with. Yeah, this is the kind. This is the kind of, the kinds of problems that we'd like to solve, although probably not at this level of density. You know, and the kind of knowledge that we'd like to, to build in, to build up in a, in a knowledge base. Uh, Jason. Uh, might I ask you to go back to the conclusion slide? This one? Yeah, so, so I want to ask, uh, I guess, three obvious questions. Um, one, is, uh, one, one is easy. I'll just ask them all, and then you can decide what to answer. Uh, one is easy, and it's, uh, um, are, are you sure you're using the right parser or tree bank, given that it doesn't give you back everything that you need? So there are a lot of the relations that you talked about not being able to recover with the Charnack parser uh, are expressed in dependency tree banks. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the first one. Second is, uh, um, I, I, I really believe your account uh, of the, of the, of the uh, formally expressed close reading that you've given here. Uh, and I'd, I'd like to understand better what the um, computational, uh, what, what the computational cost is of finding, say, the optimal reading. So you, clearly there's the same issue that you have in parsing in that uh, you can justify any parse by saying these rules are in my grammar, but there's uh, an exponential explosion of parses, uh, and you need to somehow score them and find out. So what would right. the scoring model be, and what would the search algorithm be? Right. Uh, and finally, the third question is, when you say that uh, most of what's going on here is a lexical or near lexical nature, uh, do you think that'll hold up when, say, reading the newspaper? I'm not convinced that it will because of, you know, plenty of examples about timeline resolution and some of your own examples about uh, pronoun resolution. Um, I think, uh, well, on the last question first, I think yeah. that, uh, you know, 70 to 80 percent of the, uh, even in technical writing, except for molecular biology, uh, 70 or 80 percent of the words are ordinary words used in their ordinary senses. And, um, and, and for those, I, my guess is that what we need is a, a pretty straightforward uh, lexical knowledge. I mean, I'm surely that, you know, we're, we're going to need other more technical knowledge, more esoteric knowledge, more uh, complicated knowledge, but, but uh, uh, you know, I would like to, I'd be happy just to get the base. Uh, I, I guess it's not deep knowledge that I'm wondering about, but rather reasoning. Um, so, so you know, you, you, you have... and Moldovan uh, argued that, uh, or claimed that they, um, Never had to. If you don't, if you don't find uh, the inference that you want within, or the connection that you want within four uh, four ply of, of inference, uh, then you're probably not going to find it. Um, so I doubt if the the inferencing is is all that deep. I don't know. I mean, that that would be my guess. Uh, on the uh, the choice function. I mean, one reason for giving the um, talk here is uh, is uh, to get some help on the uh, on the choice function because that's that's clearly uh, you know a matter that has to be uh, determined um, in part uh, uh, probabilistically. We, we happen to be building a weighted theorem prover, so that might be a good thing for you. <laughs> right. Um, the um, you know, but the kinds of factors that you want to take into account are you want to exploit the inherent redu redundancy in the natural language discourse. Uh, you want to favor plausible inferences over implausible ones. You want to favor short proofs over long proofs. Uh, you want to favor things that are relevant or salient to the topic over things that aren't. Uh, those are some of the kinds of uh, factors you'd like to uh, you know, take into consideration.
but it, that's a, certainly an area where, uh, from my standpoint, theory is lacking. It would be great to discuss it. And you had the, the first question you had was? Oh, yeah, whether uh, this was just about the particular parser you were using. Yeah, um, and, uh, uh, I mean, my experience and uh, limited experience and, uh, and sort of reports from others are that uh, Charniac's parser is the, uh, is the most reliable. Uh, but if, uh, if, you know, there are dependency parsers that are more reliable, I'd like to hear about them. Let's check it out then. Yeah. Yeah, I also sort of, would, I don't know if I feel as strongly as Jason does, because when you say lexical or near lexical knowledge, you're of course talking about fairly detailed lexical knowledge, yeah. right? So even there, though, it's not clear. For example, like, you know, okay, I love X, Y, so probably X is something animate, something that's capable of loving. And then, of course, you can use an inanimate object, like in this case, time comes to you and does something. Mm -hmm. And when do you know that that's okay? I don't. I think that's beyond lexical, right? That's that's. Well, okay. I mean, I am thinking of deep lexical, right? You know, so so that, that you know, knowledge that towers have walls, for example, is not exactly lexical. Right. Um, but that already, to me, is pretty deep lexical. Yeah. And okay. And, and, think and that I, I'd, want to, I'd want to go at least that deep. Yeah. Right. yeah, well, I, I was worried about, I, I think this is your example, uh, the city council denied the women a permit because they feared versus advocated violence. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that requires reasoning right. uh, about motives. Uh, and it doesn't in the same way, if I'm reading an article, just, uh, yeah. uh, if, if, I, if I'm reading an article in the newspaper about the latest twists and turns in some political campaign, yeah. uh, not only do I have to recall relevant knowledge, let's, let's ignore that, uh, but uh, just putting the events that are mentioned in the article uh, yeah. which is presented in most important first rather than chronologically. Just taking those events, uh, reasoning through the tenses and the order of presentation uh, and plausibility to reconstruct some plausible order of events yeah. uh, is actually quite difficult and requires something deep. Now maybe you don't want to recover that. Now, actually, I think that Leningrad example is, uh, is a... Um, That's Leningrad, sorry. Yeah, is, is uh, actually a good illustration of my point. Okay. Uh, so the example is, um, you know, the, <coughs> the police uh, prohibited the women from demonstrating because they feared violence. Now, who, who fears violence, the police or the women? And, um, and the account that uh, Winograd originally gave was, you know, said, well, you have to know all about police and you have to know about demonstrations and you have to know about, you know, modern day politics and all this. And you don't have to know that stuff. What you have to know about is causal, the possibility of causal relation between adjacent clauses. Uh, you have to know that, um, well, you do have to know that, uh, that demonstrations sometimes cause violence. Um, you have to know relations between fear and not wanting something and prohibiting it if you're in authority. Uh, but these are, you know, these are not the, uh, the deep esoteric knowledge about politics that Winograd said you had to know. They're, they're kind of the, the, the ordinary meanings of words. Um, so it seems to me that that particular example is an example where, where you don't need the... Um, um, you know, this, this esoteric knowledge. And, you know, I mean, another example is uh, one of the old examples was, uh, uh, you know, don't buy uh, Jane a kite for her birthday. She already has a kite. She'll make you take it back. Which, which what's being taken back? You know, it's, is it the one she already has or the one, you know, you're going to buy her? And, you know, he said you have to know about birthday parties and you got to know about ice cream and presents and balloons and everything else, and you don't. You just have to know about the word back, you know, that it presupposes some motion in this way. Well, what's the motion in this way? Well, it's the, the buying. Uh, yeah. So if you have a thought, uh, you say that there is somebody who thinks. Right. And so I suppose that if you have a flight, you will have somebody who flies. But if you have a sentence like, uh, the flight has been canceled, now somewhere in your system there will be that somebody is flying. No, there, there's a possible flying event. And uh, what Cancel tells you is that, that possible flying event. So, I mean, what, what, what language gives you is not, is not reality. It's, I mean, that you kind of have to figure out separately. Um, you know, what, what it gives you is the, the uh, set of possible events and possible eventualities. And then you have to figure out from the structure of the sentence uh, which of these things really exist in the real world. And so when you see the flight was canceled, you say, oh, well, uh, the cancellation really existed. That means the flight didn't really exist. The flying event didn't really exist. 
so, so basically, what you have in your logical form is a possible flying event. And then you conclude about that possible flying event that it didn't really exist in the real world. But the existential quantification in the logical form is over, the, uh, is over possible eventualities and entities, possible individuals, not over actual. But sort of the actuality is a, is a property of that possible individual, sort of the way things are treated here. Or are you all out? Yes, thank you. Are all out warm? Yeah.